run Indian operations for Wilgro. We're an incubator of early stage social enterprise. Every year we fund, mentor, provide other resources to about 25 to 30 social entrepreneurs in the fields of agriculture, energy, education, and healthcare. So for us, um, this is really the heart of what we do. It is making impactful innovators succeed, people who are applying innovative solutions to solving some of our society's hardest problems, problems that oftentimes may have been in existence for the last four or 5,000 years. <laughs> what I'm going to expand on during the course of the day is how we help these entrepreneurs. I think it's very important for any social innovation to be very deeply grounded in the reality of the problems that are being faced by the people that experience those problems. Very important for these innovations to be game-changing, path-breaking, uh, to be something that you know, truly creates outsized impact, dramatically changes the cost of solving a particular problem, does it in ways that are unprecedented. And the power of invention in that is something that we've realized through our work uh, and through our work with the Lamelson Foundation. And lastly, uh, all of this invention and innovation is of no use if it doesn't find its way finally to the marketplace and reach some degree of scale. And so our way is um, helping these entrepreneurs not just think through the innovation per se, but also delivery mechanisms, partnerships, the last mile connectivity, the business model, the revenue model that is so important to making these things reach the beneficiaries and create the impact in the marketplace. Back to you. Thanks. Thanks, Gan. Swapna, would you like to share your story of Drishti, how you, how you thought of the idea and how you now scaled and diversified? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Meena, uh, I would like to make a small correction that uh, on papers, of course, I'm not the co-founder of Drishti, uh, but yes, I'm married to the co-founder and it actually grows in the heart. So it's, uh, it's basically like being almost wedded to the idea of uh, or the concept of Drishti. So uh, here what uh, makes uh, uh, me really think and, and really look at this of afternoon as an opportunity to uh, bring in some thoughts which uh, really uh, would, uh, I think, bring in the perspective of any social enterprise for that matter. and. Uh, to tell you another uh, very interesting fact is that I think almost four to five years of our existence, we realized that we were a social enterprise. And uh, <laughs> it, it just didn't start as, as a social enterprise. And I think that yeah. actually uh, denotes that the idea mm -hmm. of being a social enterprise or the idea of implementing uh, a model doesn't really start as, as it looks, say, after 15 years or after 10 years of its being. So what it really starts with is, again, a very interesting thing what Guns has just mentioned is the approach of problem solving. So bringing in solution. So any innovation, if it is not a part of the solution, doesn't sustain. And that is one small learning what we are just carrying forward. And everything what we try and do, everything what we try and evolve, it just works around some very basic uh, rules. Uh, like, and, and every time we do the basic ri basics right, we are you know, going ahead. And whenever we do not make the basics right, we have failed. So, and we do such mistakes every time. So it's like a lot of failures. And every time we have to, f again, you know, cover up all our strengths, again, focus <clears throat> and say that let's do the basics right. And whenever we do problem solving, whenever we see the right stakeholders coming in with the same intent and coming in with the intent of creating solutions, it has worked. And our work basically is uh, for the rural communities. We just started with the very basic idea that let's take the services which are not existing in the rural communities. And uh, because we were a small technology uh, solution provider group, uh, in uh, way back in 2000, uh, uh, we worked in MP for the government of Madhya Pradesh. And from there, the idea of e-governance and then other services came in. And then 2004-05, uh, we were breaking even. Around 2006, we broke even. But we were still known as like the network which actually provided ICT for D 
services which is like ICT for development and then this segmentation brought in very uh, this uh, like different kind of opportunities to us of course like the services and products started flowing into the network and the partners who came in with different ideas and different products in mind actually brought in a lot of learning for us also that it doesn't basically again starts with the product it doesn't start with the service it starts with what is really needed and so again many failures and then we slowly understood that how it has to really start and uh, again there we uh, we have been working with different partners and then uh, around 2006 another milestone came in when we really started asking that who's our customer so if an organization after say six to seven years of existence asks a question that look who's our customer that is something again a character of drishti which where you can always ask questions about even even your being so that's the character of drishti and i think it comes from our co-founders like satyan and it's like we were catering to the entrepreneurs and we were working with local rural people as our entrepreneur front end and till 2006 7 we were looking at them as our customer and we were bringing in all the services to make this kiosk sustain and then the whole game changed when we said that no community is our customer so we went a stage a step deeper and that is where the real drishti evolved from where we started maybe we started with the right seeds in place but we looked uh, for each step of evolution and this step of evolution was very important for us which happened around 2007-8 and beyond that we've been growing into the areas of livelihood creation uh, taking 4C as an approach which is like community, capacity, capital and channel which is like normally the whole idea of these micro enterprises we try and support and nurture it starts with the market and it has to connect deeply with the community's need and opportunities which are there. So in a nutshell, the idea is to enable and nurture sustainable rural enterprises with this 4C approach <coughs> and everything else like stakeholders, partners and capacity building, everything else falls in there. Thanks, Vapna. So basically what I hear from you is question, you know, question the, the problem and then the solution will come in question how you're doing it so that you can then refine the processes and you know you can learn from your failure so the basic thing is keep questioning at different stages to, I think to so. give the answer uh, Rikin may I invite you to share your story about how you thought of digital green and how you thought of technology sure. as uh, thanks uh, thanks Meena uh, it's great to be here um, in, I first stepped into rural India about 10 years ago, uh, trying to work with some friends from college who are trying to start up a biodiesel venture, uh, trying to promote the, the cultivation of Jatropha and Pongamia to start a biodiesel business. And what I immediately saw was that, you know, there's a small number of farmers who are seeing farming as a source of prosperity for themselves and for their families. And there's the larger set of folks who are just trying to migrate as quickly as possible out of agriculture because they see it as sort of a vocation of, of last resort. I then connected with Microsoft Research in a group looking at technology for emerging markets uh, to think about from a very academic perspective, is there a role for information technology, just as Swapna just mentioned, for in the agricultural space. And so I was coming from a very uh, engineering and technology that based background. And so by its nature, we needed to kind of take an approach of partnership because we fundamentally had no experience or expertise in areas of agriculture or rural development. And we, so we started by immersing ourselves in just a set of communities outside of Bangalore that a small NGO called Green Foundation was working in. And that was in 2006. And we went through a, a pretty iterative process of developing sort of uh, different tools of technology from paper to video to audio and trying to think about the role of sort of human mediation in the process and see what was actually effective with regard to farmers actually taking up these practices for themselves and seeing some sort of uh, utility in terms of their, their livelihoods. So since then, we've kind of grown into, an, uh, we spun off and we've, uh, we've grown into a full-fledged organization. 
I think one of the core learnings that we had, even from the days that we were at Microsoft till today, is to basically say that, you know, sometimes, especially for a technologist, innovation is sometimes the product. Mm -hmm. And what innovation, what the, what the interesting part is, is that, yeah, that that surely has some value. And, you know, there certainly is a lot of glamour associated with a particular product that you might develop from a technology point of view. But these innovations are basically sandwiched between people, people who kind of produce these innovations and people who use these innovations for like sort of their, their benefit and for some sort of value creation. And so for us, that's where like innovation really has uh, taken to heart. So what we do is we partner with existing organizations that are already working with rural communities, already trying to train farmers, for example, through farmer field schools, demonstration plots. These programs are already taking place. And then what we do is we train them on how to produce short videos that are by the community for the community to exchange agricultural practices. And the first question that people ask is not about like the economics of a particular practice, but rather what's the name of the person in the video and which village is he or she from? And then the videos aren't just sort of distributed in some passive way online where people are just kind of self-servicing themselves. We're working with rural communities where there's fundamental challenges of even people's self-confidence and self-efficacy about and motivation to actually think about new information that they might consider for themselves. And so that information is presented by a, a village level facilitator in community groups like women's self-help groups that might already involved in some microcredit and savings activity. And now these locally produced videos are adding a knowledge sharing dimension to that. And a local facilitator from the community is pausing, rewinding, asking questions, getting feedback, kind of facilitating individuals interaction with this content. And it's not just sort of a one-off type of screening, it's done every two weeks in sync with the agricultural cropping season so that people who watch a video today can actually apply that practice in the next two weeks. And then we also put a lot of rigor with respect to capturing data and feedback at each screening, who watched what video, what questions did they ask, what do they like or not like, what practices did they adopt or apply on their own farms and which did they not. And that data and that feedback then kind of helps inform and iterate the production distribution of the next set of, of videos that gets produced. And so for us, it's kind of creating those types of learning or innovation cycles for the communities themselves by using technology as sort of an enabler uh, and using sort of the social organizations of both these communities and the organizations that are already working with them, government and civil society primarily, to be basically use technology to amplify the work that they're already doing, uh, to be able to make it more efficient and to increase the level of participation of the communities that they're they're working with. And along the way, the type of innovation that takes place is at one level at the community level, where we're basically seeing like greater efficiency in the way that farmers are essentially uh, uh, informed about new practices that can improve their productivity and livelihoods. But at another level, it's also improving uh, the systemization of these uh, organizations that work with these rural communities. Even just the fact of producing a video requires sort of this organization to come together and have some consensus about what are the practices that we're trying to promote. It kind of builds some consistency and quality into their programs because now there's a, a physical artifact in the form of a video of what they're trying to promote. And there's a, a systematized way in which that's also shared, not just sort of in an ad hoc fashion, but on a fixed schedule that's in sync with the calendar and that it takes in data that isn't just sort of anecdotal in nature, but that's at an individual farmer level to be able to inform how programs can be made, you know, more targeted. So that's, you know, maybe some of the, the journey. <laughs> well, thanks, Rikin. So I think um, what what I hear from you is um, innovation need not be seen as, you know, as, as a process. It can also be, in some cases, seen as the end, end result of a series of immersions that you might have with the community and having a focus and immersing yourself in the in in who the end user is going to be of the innovation is very critical to developing the innovation itself so sure. uh philip now we come to you save the best for last I was saying, uh, now for, for now something completely different <laughs> uh, now is the time when i start singing um philip um Lemons Foundation for, for many, many years has been at the forefront of funding a lot of innovations that have supported you know, low-income communities. So when you look at innovations and when you look at the entire landscape, what is it about certain innovations that, that strike you? So from your experience, how you look at social innovation from? Well, I, I would say the Lomason Foundation, for those of you who don't know, is a 
Private Family Foundation headquartered in Portland, Oregon. And I think what distinguishes us is we see invention as a way to um, improve economy. So we see tangible products, you know, we see technologies like clean water, medical technologies. We really see that as a way to help improve people's lives. In fact, our part of our mission statement is, you know, improving lives through invention. So we have a very specific focus. Our uh, founder was an inventor at 604 patents across all spectrums. And he really believed that, you know, to drive economies, to drive competitiveness and help people out of poverty, tangible product-based business was the way to do it. And even when you introduced me and said I was the chief financial administrative officer, I thought that, you know, in our foundation, I have my own portfolio that I share with program officers. So we, we as a team are always looking at what is the best method to help a company or a fund. So it could be a grant. It could be what foundations have, a private um, PRI, program-related investment. It could be debt. It could be equity. So I think we as a foundation have been very creative in the tools that we see. Um, we've partnered with Vilgro for 10 years, and I think Vilgro really sort of epitomizes the model we see for entrepreneurs of incubation, mentoring, and they're now adding a fund so that the that the companies will now have a way for seed stage capital. In fact, um, we did a study this past year. Um, we had a thesis there was a gap in seed stage financing between fifty and five hundred thousand dollars, and that was really the critical piece for companies in the, in the social impact space. And you know, it's not surprising the results of that study confirmed our hypothesis. But in addition to that, said that there's a really critical need for working capital for the right time of financial instruments. There's the need for, we call it CFO without borders. So chief financial officer controller type, you know, within a company looking at the, the budgeting cash flows, is this the right kind of financing? We also see these companies need investment banking services. When they go to get a round of financing, is this the right kind of money at the right time? What are the term sheets? We also see a big need for early stage grants so the companies we deal with have prototyping. So there's, we see the need for very early stage to help some of these companies out to either uh, prove out their prototype, do field studies. But we also see that our capital needs to be very carefully used. That yeah. a lot of these companies, the grant grants will come in very early, but then there's a need for equity or debt. So we try to be very careful in that stage. So I think our lessons learned really have been to be very flexible in how we approach. Um, we're about creating an ecosystem for these businesses. How can we help these entrepreneurs over, over the really critical early phases of, of this to the point where we can hand them off to other funders to scale them up? So we would be looking very early idea, certainly early product, pre-revenue, Sometimes people may have sold one thing, but we see our critical role in that very, very early stage and surrounding that entrepreneur with the ecosystem to help them thrive. Okay, thanks. So what I'm hearing is it's not just important for an innovation to be, to be there, but the innovation also needs to be nurtured and, and there needs to be an entire ecosystem that, that helps nurture it. So we find that a lot of times mentoring is as important as the money. Mm -hmm. So we've also okay. seen that if a company gets too much money or the wrong kind of money at a time and they don't know how to deal with it, mm -hmm. sometimes it will kill the company. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important, and I think this is a lesson with Vilgro, is to really couple mm -hmm. the money or different tranches of money with mentoring and assistance so that entrepreneur really is making really the right decision to help them move along. and that again, they, they, but the important thing is that you have those kinds of mentoring skills as you move along. Okay, thanks. Uh, just uh, to close that uh, conversation, Guns, if you could just share a little bit about, you know, when, when Philip is saying that it's not just getting the money is important, but when you get the money is important. So in your experience, uh, and I know Vilguru has mentored and incubated over 100, uh, you know, startup social enterprises, what are some of these lessons learned in other than funding in your opinion what are all the other things that you've seen on ground as that you support social enterprises with sure so some uh, <clears throat> lessons obviously there are many over the last 14 years but i'll draw upon a few major ones 
I think the first thing is that we see, uh, we like to focus on entrepreneurs who are focused on the problem and not so much fixated on the solution they may have already come up with. So you've got to be secular about the problem and then you've got to realize that there may be different ways of addressing that problem. Um, entrepreneurs who are too much in love with their particular starting approach are difficult to work with because oftentimes they're not secular enough about the problem. So, uh, you know, sending them into the field, and having them really challenge themselves, experience that reality, is an important part of the first piece of work that we do with them. And then the second thing is that, you know, just realizing that there's a lot of risk but then being systematic about eliminating that risk and so mm. developing a good plan by which we identify the risk and then we identify a plan to de-risk those elements and so say that in three months we want to have the necessary you know have tested through lean experimentation these specific four items and then have closed them out and made a decision one way or the other and moved forward i think developing that plan to take the risk that's involved with that super early stage product development type of process take that out and then if you link the funding to that i think uh, you know this sounds nasty but it does sharpen for people's minds because if i tell an entrepreneur that you know you've got enough money to be able to run these experiments and to arrive at these answers and if you do a good job of running those experiments irrespective of what the answers are if you've done a good job of that then the next wave of money will come to the next piece we find that then the execution quality improves quite significantly so just layering the funding uh, related to milestones, keeping it on short cycles, uh, improves the speed and quality of uh, execution. Okay. I really like the fact that um, you look at innovators who are secular, secular about looking at the problem and not too much in love with their innovation. So, um, we did a, a fairly detailed oral history project in 2013 in partnership with Wilgro and IDRC. Um, and created what is called as the Voices of Experience project on social innovation to understand what barriers exist, uh, you know, for social innovation and how it can be facilitated. And I'd, I'd just like to summarize some of the uh, facilitators of innovation that uh, we we found. Um, just going to skip these. Okay, so. One of the, um, some of the, uh, let me go back. Some of the drivers were first was um, funding and capital, which we talked about, uh, which Philip talked about as well. So it's not just in terms of getting the capital, but when you get the capital and how much. Second is mentoring and mentoring, not just in terms of creating the technology prototype, but also mentoring in terms of, uh, you know, business models and business support and, um, you know, other, all kinds of mentoring support. Third, very crucially was capacity building. Um, there were many, many uh, cases where we found that uh, people who were in too much in love with their own innovation uh, just refused to see past it. So where, um, you know, capacity building really helped foster where they developed new skills to understand how to address a particular problem better. Fourth was networking and collaboration, you know, where having just a space or an opportunity to, to meet with people, to discuss, to uh, bounce of ideas was very, very helpful in fostering and nurturing uh, innovation. Fifth was talent and people, uh, critical, uh, where it's while an innovator can think of an idea um, and initiate it, but to foster and nurture, he or she needs a team and, and team to sort of foster it. So talent and people. Um, sixth was government. In many cases where the innovation uh, can really impact on ground only through scale or through uh, you know reaching the absolute base of the pyramid, having the government or uh, state level support was very, very critical. Seventh was mobi community mobilization. Uh, again, an innovation is only as effective as the community that it serves. And mobilizing the community to adopt the innovation, create awareness about it, was another critical driver. Eight was outreach and awareness, um, obvious reasons. Ninth was research, where again, it, was, it goes back to the point about how the innovation constantly needs to be questioned, like you know, Swapna mentioned and constantly needs to uh, go back and answer the problem. And the 10th was the role of the private sector. 
So while we talked about a few of those uh, drivers and facilitators and real life examples uh, through our panelists, uh, there were just a couple uh, of examples that I want to cite here to just make sure that the discussion is uh, as wholesome as possible. Okay. So this one, uh, one of the cases that we um, did was with Bill Fees, um, also with the Technologies for Emerging, Emerging Marketing Market Group uh, of Microsoft that Rickin used to be. Uh, so one of the points that he mentioned um, was, you know, the, the criticality of immersing uh, yourself in the problem and understanding community needs before even determining whether a particular innovation is useful or not. And the point that he uh, made was that in, in most cases, uh, people, innovators themselves, and especially technologists, uh, may not have the right background or the opportunity to immerse completely uh, with, the, with the ground level organizations. So where, uh, you know, the point that he tries to make in his case was that when they look at research, when Microsoft looks at research for low income communities, Domain expertise does not have to be necessarily a barrier where he talks about, um, you know, talking to partners, talking to people who are experts, you know, be it in the area of education, renewable energy, healthcare, whatever. But the important uh, to understand and work with them in, in, in collaboration to help prioritizing which innovations to work for. And so that's, you know, that's, that's a um, perspective that I'd like to share uh, that how private sector uh, and uh, research is sort of contributing towards uh, social innovation and how that can be a critical uh, driver. The second one uh, that we talked about was around collaboration and networking. Uh, Pooja Warrior, who runs um, Unlimited, uh, more importantly talks about the importance of creating, a, you know, a workspace. So basically she uh, try to, uh, you know, highlight the point in her case study and, and the takeaway from that was that entrepreneurs and innovators who are focused uh, at any given point in time, you may diversify over a period of time, say, you know, point that Swapna was making about, you know, over a period of 15 years, Drishti might be doing, you know, 15 different things, but it didn't start off like that. When you, the entrepreneurs who are more focused at a particular point in time with fewer products and services generally tend to do better and the ability to collaborate again is critical. And the third um, uh, very interesting and important um, uh, point that I'd like to sort of highlight is a case that we did with Professor Nagarajan of the Center for Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship who talked about you know the the fact that students in India and um, <coughs> students in India and his, his experience were not really risk takers, not because they lacked the ability to take risk, but the fact that uh, they are under a lot more pressure to take up more conventional jobs than others. And innovation by its very nature needs an open culture and a risk taking ability. And he talks about the fact that, you know, mentorship in many ways, or, you know, when talking about experience, uh, uh, people who are already social uh, innovators and who have run successful social enterprises who are alumni can come and talk about because one of the biggest influencers for students and potential young innovators are their peers and their seniors. So while we, so these are some of the other perspectives other than the, other than the ones that we shared in the panel that I wanted to sort of um, uh, bring about. The one uh, critical facilitator that we haven't addressed so far uh, is the government, you know, the role of the government. So if I can just go around the table in terms of, in your opinion, and when we say the government, we don't necessarily mean uh, the government in its entirety, but you know the regulation, legislation, uh, various aspects that the government could get involved in. What do you think is is how critical is that role? And in your experience, how did how do you see that sort of panning out to facilitate and foster a culture of innovation? You know, as a U.S. foundation, I think that some of the governmental regulation in India has made us be more creative. Okay. Because, for instance, we can um, make an equity investment in Indian company very easily. It's very easy for us to do. But we could not do working capital or debt. That We, we can't do that. So I think we've had to be very creative on how we, we've done that. Um, 
We were the first U.S. foundation to actually become a SEBI registered investor so we could invest directly in a venture capital fund. And I think because we were first in, um, Indian regulators didn't really know what a private foundation was, you know, so I think the process was longer. But I think that's gotten better. And I think um, we had a conversation with our tax advisor in Mumbai on Tuesday, and I think in this year's budget, there are some hopeful signs that some of the working capital needs in manufacturing, some of that's going to be loosened. So I think that we're seeing that in the right direction. But I also think we all just came from a meeting with governmental people and how can we partner with them to, to bring this. And I think a lot of the concerns that they've identified you know, with working capital and mentorship, I think we, we agree with them. So I think it's, you know, government plays a crucial role and I think we've tried diligently to, to bring them in conversation and with Vilgro, Vilgro's in, com in combination too. So I think it's a critical element. Okay. So Ricky, in your opinion, and you know, you work um, in, in multiple geographies as well. So uh, do you think the, the state's role in India is conducive to support social innovation? For sure. Uh, so we, we, we work, you know, in with about a 400,000 women uh, in across 4,000 villages in nine states in India. And we've been able to do that in largely just the last three years. And that's only been because we partnered with the government. So in particular, we work with a, a program called the Ministry of Rural Development's National Rural Livelihood Mission. And they've made a lot of the foundational investments in mobilizing community groups like women's self-help groups. They've made the investment in having village level extension agents. And these are the core building blocks for us to be able to introduce sort of our approach. Without sort of those investments, it would be hard if not impossible for us to do that. And I think now under the sort of cooperative uh, federalism type of structure of the, of the current government, there's a great deal of greater action now even at the state level where they're the ones who are actually having a greater sort of role with respect to allocating resources, determining where those investments are and what are the types of development efforts that they want to focus on. And so as so a, a social organization that is seeking to basically support and improve the efficiency of existing development efforts, these are our kind of core partners. They're the ones who have the domain expertise. They're the ones who have the community mobilization base for us to actually roll out sort of our approach. And I think wherever you're able to get a stronger alignment, the the greater amount of scale and ultimate sustainability that you actually see in these interventions actually succeeding. Okay, thanks. So I know Drishti is a for-profit organization. How difficult or easy is it to get government to fund and support and, and help streamline and reach out your innovations to the ground as it is for a non-profit? Uh, again, uh, here, what I would like to bring up is that like what we are looking at government is in terms of, as you just said, the enabler of a kind of an ecosystem, uh, which includes anything and everything uh, like education, like infrastructure, like schemes and plans. So I would like to touch upon all these three things because we have worked with government as service providers, as partners. And of course, many skilling programs, many livelihood creation programs have been supported. But the idea around working with government is always like a plus and a minus. But I would like to bring up some fundamental questions here that, say for example, if you are looking at colleges or the students from the colleges or institutes being social innovators or risk takers, as we say, that we need to really ask questions like the government, does it allow any kind of failures in the education system. Are we not really creating the students who always uh, have a fear of failing? So if from the beginning, the education is such and the mindsets in India are from many years that uh, like there is a failure and there is a risk of failure, which just sets in into your mind from the very beginning, whether you look at the rural schools, whether you look at the semi-urban or the urban, they're just following the same standard, which is like the following of the very important fear of failure. Now, if that fear of failure starts from the education and the worst part is that that's completely the same in the rural and semi-urban schools also, where there is a need of innovation at each step. And if the rural schools are also following the same pattern, they are completely in a big state of confusion. 
and at the age of 18 then we start talking about skilling then we start talking about uh, social innovators then we start talking about facilitation so there's this kind of a gap there and we are really seeing that such fundamental questions need to be asked the second thing is of course infrastructure and schemes where we are seeing some facilitation support slowly growing but again it's like uh, a process which needs to be speeded up uh, speedened up um, so we've uh, seen, um, you know, multiple types of innovation and how innovation can be fostered. And it does not have to be only in terms seen in terms of a product or a service. It could also be in terms of a business model or financing or organizational structure. Um, Gun, so in your, in the many uh, innovations that you support and you and you nurture, how important do you think it is uh, for organizations or early stage entrepreneurs to not just look at uh, taking an innovation to reality, but also have the open mindset to be innovative about multiple other things that surround in getting the innovation to market, which is around business model, which is around organizational structure? Yeah, so obviously, <clears throat> I wouldn't encourage innovation for innovation's sake. Uh, but at the same time, I think you have to be creative and innovative about every little aspect of the model if you have to maximize your chances of success. So let me give you an example of a cook stove company that we worked with. It's a very powerful technical innovation because it would save almost five, 6,000 rupees a month in firewood for a commercial cook stove operator. And it's a 25,000 rupee cook stove, so it's a five month payback. But a lot of these people didn't have their 25,000 rupees to put up up front. And so, you know, the natural solution is let's find a bank to finance it. So we found a bank, the Indian Overseas Bank was signed up as a banking partner. And the first customer we took to them, they gave them a form which was to be filled in seven copies and they had to get a counter signatory and they had to bring the patta of their land so that they could mortgage that against this 25,000 rupee loan. Obviously, not a single loan was placed six months later. We then said, okay, let's go to a, an MFI. And we found a fairly dynamic MFI. The MFI had, you know, simpler processes, so they didn't need, you know, guarantees and things like that. But they still had, uh, you know, they needed post-dated checks. And so this man who's actually operating his little dhaba or his cook store and, and, you know, making the food, now has to close this down, go to the, into the city, and deposit the cash that he has so that the check can be presented by the MFI didn't work. We maybe placed one or two loans a month out of, you know, 70, 80 stoves that were sold each month. Then we found a peer to peer lending organization that was working with field level NGOs that would have a minimum of paperwork because a field level NGO knew this particular, you know, Dhaba owner. And at the same time, they had a chap on a motorcycle who would come every week and then he would collect the cash, uh, you know, the payment from the vendor, from the street food vendor at his premises. That model has really worked. So it took us three and a half years to figure this out. Uh, you know, if we could have cut that down, if we could have been much more innovative about the financing piece in year one, in the first six months, we could have made a big difference to the sales of that company. So it wasn't enough that you designed a really innovative, technically com you know, ex great product and manufactured it really well and measured the benefits that it delivered. You have to innovate on all of those little aspects and you have to innovate from the customer's perspective if those things have to work. So it is super critical The every link, I mean, you know, when you look back sometimes on enterprise, it is, an ama it is amazing that some of them actually succeed because there are just so many things that need to go right. Every little detail needs to be thought through well for you to be actually uh, able to succeed and scale in the marketplace. Thanks. Uh, there are many people in the audience who have been innovators themselves and who persist every day, every year uh, and still are at it after many years with that innovation. And, We'd, uh, before we oh, throw the floor open for questions, would like to, you know, throw the floor open for anyone who wants to share their story uh, that brings out Jacob. I guess I had a clown when I was a kid. You know, it was one of those inflatable clowns, weighted base. You could keep knocking it down. <laughs> Stupidly keep coming back up. 
I think that sort of sums up uh, <laughs> what many of us do. Except I wish that, I mean, unlike the clown, we don't sort of spring up exactly the same way and spring up slightly differently. But I think that's part of the makeup. For those who don't know, Jacob um, co founded uh, Spring Health, uh, which um, now reaches to about 30,000 households uh, with uh, good quality drinking water in states in Orissa uh, and adjoining sort of areas. So. <laughs> All right. Any other stories of what you think is important? So we heard a new one, which is persistence, that you have to be at it. And sometimes you find you will take three and a half years. Sometimes you will take five years to find the right answer and still struggle. Uh, any other stories before we? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Saif Kamal and I'm from Bangladesh. I'm starting a social in uh, incubation lab there. So I'm just hoping. Um, I think one of the most challenging part of my at least last one and a half, two years of understanding this is it is so different in terms of the ecosystem support. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a major challenge uh, as, um, you know, where every country has a different stage of it. And like for us, it's very important not just to have a, a innovation part of it because innovation comes with a risk. It needs patience, but also having that knowledge dispersed there are a lot of enthusiasm, there's a lot of zeal in there, but they don't have the right knowledge base to transform their solution into a product. The knowledge base is just not there. How do we give it to them, these kind of things, and come up with programs for it? I mean, there are, I think there's a mismatch of the developed world and developing world. And I was in one of the developed worlds, these sessions, and I told them that you guys have the resources, which is not just money, but also the knowledge and everything. But you're sitting 25,000 miles away from a problem and solving it. Why don't you actually help someone there to actually support, have local one? So I think uh, it's great that Foundation Lemonson and everyone else is coming to this part of the world. But um, it's, I, uh, I would say that give us a lot of patience for us to actually figure things out because it's not a tailored piece that one size fits all. That's Thanks, Sef. Actually, this part of the world actually has a number of uh, very interesting incubators. We have two people sitting right here on this panel, so make sure you catch hold of them uh, once, you, once we finish this panel. But this part of the world actually has a lot of um, real-time immersed learning centers, so I don't think there is, uh, I would disagree with you there. Um, any other questions that you might have? Yes. Yeah, can you have a second? Sorry. Uh, the, yes. The patience question. Can I? This is something that is kind of, you know, the patience question. We, I've been, a, I lived in the Silicon Valley and I did a startup in the Silicon Valley. I've seen the pace at which some of those companies develop things. I've seen the pace at which some of the companies in Bangalore develop things. And I feel like the social sector doesn't have that sense of urgency that we should be having. I have an entrepreneur who works on cervical cancer screening. And so his device is going to screen for cervical cancer. Now a woman dies of cervical cancer every seven minutes. I mean, every seven minutes that we are late, there is another life that's lost because that machine didn't make it out there. I do not see that sense of urgency and that burning fire to, you know, execute in the way in which commercial entrepreneurs execute in the social sector. And I don't know why. We should be even faster. We should be burning the midnight oil on both ends all the time, even more than commercial entrepreneurs, because we're not doing it to make money. We're doing it to save the world. But I don't know why we don't find it. Okay, I just wanted to make that point when the issue of patience came up. Important point, sorry. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ravi Sinha. I am associated in advisory capacity with several social enterprises now. I uh, want to make an observation on actually two points. And uh, one is uh, something which I have learned in the four years that I've been with this space now is a lot of innovations actually don't make an impact is simply because it is thought in English and implemented in Hindi. You know, if you know what I'm saying, it's, it's basically is that I don't co-create and uh, I was at and I still am associated with Drishti in some advisory capacity and for Satyan to go and co-create now with the village rather than sit here and innovate and then see how he can 
roll it out has changed the perspective of drishti and uh, so you know that is something which innovation without powerpoint without excel spreadsheet mindset is the innovation which the social sector requires and that sadly is missing to a very large extent and that's why people get frustrated because they don't implement and the second observation which is there is that a lot of innovations are piecemeal yeah. they are not holistic end to end mm -hmm. and uh, let me give you an example of a organization which i advise and reckon you will be happy to hear that this is a organization which like you call yourself digital green this is uh, you know uh, uh, you know a green energy company you know green leaf energy that's what they call themselves and they are in biodiesel but they are not biodiesel because very quickly they realize that a the government is the biggest innovator as being the greatest ngo in the world so they innovated the process of using nrlm using narega as platforms and made it into a livelihood company rather than a creator of producer of biodiesel biodiesel has become the by product and it's an end to end now so what mr gadkari was talking this morning to a large extent to some extent was a conversation that we've had with him of the end to end and he was impressed with that and i find that a lot of these innovations become piecemeal and then they fall flat you know they don't go the Entire length and breadth chain. of the spectrum in the business model yeah. you know it might be a very innovative process but the model doesn't support it and then it loses steam somewhere thanks yes if you could just also introduce yourself sir switch it on as well hello i'm anirudh i'm a researcher at copenhagen business school i'm doing research on impact investment i'm just a comment uh, all innovations are not good i mean some are not market friendly and if they are not market friendly they would fall flat having said that it's important to document all the innovations uh, make it uh, a4 or a3 size nice slide and put it on a social uh, social web page where it can be viraled or uh, patented or whatever something that that can be documented and people can learn from it and i see many times that's not that doesn't happen young people in universities have a lot of energy they got a lot of ideas but they never write it down they never document it and those ideas kind of fall flat or or get get got get, get lo loosen up somewhere so so i would say innovation is good but document it and so that somebody else uh, can build upon it and uh, develop better innovation learning from practice one of the attempts of us doing uh, capturing the voices of experience was precisely that where we it's a set of 75 videos all personal stories including failures of social enterprises i would encourage you to go through our website and see it. so any other questions yes please there and then Hello, uh, my name is Nick van Dijk. I work with the BUP Innovation Center in the Netherlands. Uh, we support uh, companies in reaching uh, BUP markets. And what I'm kind of missing in the discussion and also in the main outcomes of your research is, let's say, the focus on market. Uh, it's one thing to develop the product, to develop the innovation, but in the end it has to lead to sales in the market. And um, what we find, especially in the work that we do in Africa, is that there's quite a large difference between what a consumer needs and what a consumer wants. And often innovations are developed from a perspective of what a consumer needs and not what he or she wants. So we do a lot of uh, capacity building on marketing and distribution models with the companies that we work with. And I'm also wondering with the panel and also with you, uh, to what extent that comes back in your work and comes back in the research that you have done. Uh, thanks. Uh, we did talk about, out that's what we meant by outreach and awareness, which was one of the facilitators, uh, you know, important elements and drivers of social innovation. But does anyone want to comment about sales and marketing uh, as a specific point? Yes. So I would say that we've had a number of conversations in the past two days, um, particularly this morning, where if you don't, in fact, one, one was they had this company had developed a product, and one of them was like the absolute best product possible, and the other one was one that had it smelled good, and even though the consumer, you know, was told this is the best one, they wanted one that smelled good, and so the initial product was a flop. So I think if you don't, like, test it out in the market, if you don't see this is what people what? really want and, and and that people really do expect good quality but they also expect if you don't do your market research and yeah. if you don't have a good model 
you know, we had another situation where these engineers developed a product, but they didn't figure out a way to get it out into the field, into into hospitals or into clinics. It was a failure because they didn't figure out the model to get it out there yeah. and make it actually work. So it's still sitting in their technology shop. It's not out there helping people. Yeah, great, great uh, example. And another example was what Guns had talked about earlier, where it's not just about creating the market for it, but also the market reach, where you know, just getting the right people to the the right financial instrument to get the you know market to sort of. Uh, so one other thing I'd like to add is that I found that on the in in the West you find uh, an inventor who also has a reasonable business sense, and so there's a more all-rounded entrepreneur that you could find. Whereas the entrepreneurs that I find here. Uh, especially when we work with product-based inventors, these are technically very strong people but have absolutely no idea about how to sell something or market something or create a distribution network or a channel. And um, oftentimes they don't have the networks to even find a co-founder that might come with that complementary set of skills. And so oftentimes our work is helping them find that co-founder. Uh, and sometimes it, it is too late. You've gone two, three years into the enterprise. Now they're not willing to share equity. And so, you know, they really struggle with this lopsided management team that's technically strong, but then weak on the business marketing side. And that is super critical to making it succeed. One other thing I'd like to add is we actually incubated this thing called Wilgro Stores, which was a series of stores, a hub and spoke model to distribute innovative products to the villages. It was a real challenge for them because the innovative products face that, you know, the vicious cycle that there is no demand, therefore a distributor doesn't earn margins, therefore doesn't want to carry it, therefore there is no demand. And it just carries on like that. And then they had to start carrying other fast moving products to be able to earn a certain base of revenue. Uh, and then very soon it lost that edge or that focus on innovative products that we hoped it would have in the beginning. So last mile collective and distribution is a huge challenge here and I don't, I have not seen a single you know, solution to that problem. I'm still searching. Yeah, Ricky. Yeah. I'm just going to just make a, a plug uh, of, 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 you know, I think sales and marketing from a B2C perspective is, is one thing, and, and we've heard some perspectives. But I think, you know, one area that I think also is often not sort of touched upon, especially in the social innovation sector as much, <laughs> but, you know, obviously, just to us, we're trying to, is sort of the B2G and the B2B sort of segments. Because there's a lot of opportunities, even when like Walmart was trying to train farmers for their private extension system, it was costing them 400 US dollars per farmer that they'd work with, a pretty inefficient system, even more so than the government. And the government too also has an inefficient system. And so there's a lot of opportunity for actually bringing in innovation to support these uh, organizations. But the important bit is to drive their ownership. And so getting like their skin in the game, whether that is financial or otherwise, so that they actually institutionalize these innovations. And that, you know, actually does take time. I think that even takes time, even in the West, if you're trying to like improve the efficiency of the US government, it's not a straightforward process. Same too here, <laughs> right? So I think we have to appreciate the fact that sort of people-based systems are going to take time. Products like Uber, that can be fast. But if you're going to try to change like a large organization, that requires a long, patient sort of capital investment, right? Thanks. Uh, yes. Hi, um, my name is Nakul Pasricha. I run Pharma Secure, which is a healthcare technology company focused on battling counterfeit medicines through a technology-based solution. And I had a question based on my experience, which is uh, that, that, that you, there's a time for innovation and there's a time for just straight execution, where even though uh, there's a temptation to keep thinking of new ideas and, and continuing the innovation path. What you really need is, is to just take what you have and, and, and sell it and, and earn revenue for the company. Because really, if you're a for-profit organization, that's, that's uh, you know, primarily how you're going to scale and how you're going to sustain and, and get the social impact that you started the organization for. And I was just wondering what the panelists' view was on how you even take that decision or how you um, arrive at that awareness of, you know, kind of suspending a little bit of innovation and, and focusing more on, on just delivering um, the results that you want. So I know, uh, Swapna, you do a lot of process improvement within Rishti and uh, would you like to take that first and then we'll 
see if anyone else has a comment. It's a very interesting question, Nakul. Uh, in fact, uh, what question Nakul has put is, uh, I think, one part of the question. I would like to like put another part to it, which is like, uh, you are creating a, a distribution system or the delivery mechanism is needed, but for what? And what, what that what needs to be really answered and for whom? And here, like when I was just writing some points, I was also really wanting to put the question to this forum is that ultimately who owns this solution actually matters a lot. Like if you have an objective to create a solution which is supposed to create an impact, of course, it will in any case start with for whom. And if there is a co-ownership, like if there is an ownership within for whom and who is creating the solution, I think then half of the problem of delivery and distribution is automatically solved because then you are already connected. And this is uh, something which uh, which is really coming out of a uh, lot of failures and a lot of hidden trials what we have done that it has to just start where it actually uh, you know originates and when we are looking at say uh, people uh, I mean the solutions not being sustainable or not really working out or the delivery mechanisms and as uh, Guns just said that uh, there are uh, solutions which are provided and which do not see uh, success just because we are not connecting with for whom and at the right time. So every solution if it starts with like for whom and if there is a co-ownership because ultimately we are we always have felt that we walk the very thin line of an intervention, a creation or a co-creation and then where to leave or where, where to get it going with its own energy. So when you can really create that kind of internal energy where it can just roll on its own and when there are drivers on ground to take your solution on its own, that's the best way you can create. And therefore, we do believe in co-creating. We believe in, of course, even within that system, you can create a way of sustaining the initial uh, phase of when you're really reaching to that scale. So this is what I would say from Drishti's perspective. Uh, I'm not really sure if uh, this has answered your um, question of being able to, you know, bridge that gap with, before you create the social impact. But this is what which really works, and I don't see anything which which really works because if you if you take any other route, you're really not moving in the direction of the social impact you want to create. Then then you have to change the direction. Can see how to go. Yeah, Thank can you. I uh, <clears throat> add some things to that? So I think. Uh, another dimension let me add to that is there's the invention piece and there's the engineering piece. When do you stop invention and move to engineering? Oftentimes inventors seem to love the invention piece which is creating new stuff. You meet new customers, they ask for new things, you love that process of going back to the design and adding that feature and things. So two things need to happen. A is you need to have a sharp definition of customer. Too many inventors that I've seen want to develop the product that satisfies the union set of every customer's requirement. That is the stupidest way of starting the product design process. What you have to do instead is pick one narrow segment and then design a product for that segment. You can then add the bells and whistles that go to segment two and segment three and segment four, but you have that discipline. You know your primary customer, who's the primary customer. The second thing is you've got to have the discipline of wanting to do that hard engineering work. So now that you've designed the invention, does it really work in the field? Can it take so many transactions? Can it be operated so many times? Can it plow so many you know acres of sugarcane? Those are the things that a lot of people, you know, it, it, this is the dull, boring work, but if that work is not done, this product is never going to see the light of day. So that's the second piece. The third thing is I think if you're closely involved with your customers, especially that chosen target segment with the product development process, at some point they're going to say, you know what, this is good enough. Can I sign up for this? Can I, where do I put, you know, where do I sign? Where can I send you the money? At that point, you probably know that it's time to start sales. And then I've had entrepreneurs who are still at that point saying, you know, no, I still need to do a little more. So you've got to tell them that, you know, don't make the perfect be the enemy of the good. If customers are happy, sales will also teach you something. This is not the end of the process once you make your first sale. So the first 10, 15 customers will start using it and a whole bunch of new features or bugs are going to come back and then start fixing those at that point, but then start doing sales when customers think it's ready. Okay. 
Um, thanks. So we'll just take one more point, and we just have a few minutes left. So I'd just uh, like to have uh, okay one, and your last. Yeah. Uh, my question is to guns. Uh, guns. You were talking about you know the uh, the question on patience on. Uh, on why is it that social entrepreneurs sort of lose that fire in the belly? But if you really look at it, the reason why they started off was because they were, they really cared about that particular problem, right? So where do you think, uh, you know, people lose out? And do you think one of the answers to that is because people think that this is a really long process, because you know you can't achieve social change overnight. So is that like a excuse to to that problem, or what do you think on that? about that? <laughs> Don't know if I have the answer to that question. Honestly. I'm not saying they lose the fire in the belly. I'm saying, you know, in commercial enterprises, I'm seeing a, a, an urgency of execution. And I don't see as much of that urgency of execution, the working the late hours, the setting a deadline for yourself and not going home till that deadline is met. And I remember, uh, you know, a, a, a company is built by the culture of the stories that it tells. Naran Murthy used to tell the story of, you know, if the work's not done, the deliverable's not met, you don't go home. And one morning he came and opened the office and Shibu, who's one of his founders, emerges from the dark in his dhoti because he went to sleep at 3 a.m. after he had finished that deliverable. You know, do we see that sort of burning fire in our companies where if they say that I am going to achieve, you know, this prototype and start clinical trials on this day, I will move heaven and earth and make sure that I hit that deadline? I don't know. I'm not seeing it in my portfolio. Maybe I'm seeing only one side of the problem. Maybe there are others who are doing a, a you know, much better job in execution. But I'm feeling like we're not seeing enough of that sense of urgency. It's not like they're losing the fire in the belly. But it's not translating into execution urgency. That's my. That was my point. Okay. One last uh, comment there at the back, and then we'll. Thank you. My name is uh, Jessica. Um, I'm from Knowledge Activator, so another Dutchie in this uh, room. Um, yeah, on the basis of, of the question, what hampers innovation? Uh, from my own experience, uh, I facilitate entrepreneurial mindset and cooperative behavior. And what I see in a lot of co-work spaces where entrepreneurs uh, come together and collaborate or work on their own uh, stuff, or both, is that uh, yeah, the mindset of being an entrepreneur uh, overcome failures already mentioned but also being afraid to ask for help or ask questions or be open about it or being judgmental about yourself or others or skeptic even i think uh, in my perspective so far that's the biggest barrier um, to overcome and we are accomplished to do way more uh, even beyond our imagination and even scale up impact also socially um, than we think at the moment uh, and this is, I think, really important to embrace um, yeah, agility of this fast-changing world to really, you know, how can we get obtain all this knowledge in this room as much as possible and implement it in your work context and, and move along with it. And I get some credibility for you because you like me or whatever. I'm Dutch. And, you know, so I, I think by that, if we facilitate that ecosystem, entrepreneurial ecosystem, um, by being more brave and, and learn from each other, and, and be vulnerable, open for that. Uh, I think that will uh, that will change a, a big deal. And um, you're lucky because at five o'clock I will provide a short session for twenty minutes in the networking space. So thank you. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, sorry, we'll just have to uh, wrap up now. Uh, one one comment from each of the panelists on if you were to fuel an innovation economy. And if there was one thing you would like to do to create uh, more social innovators and foster them, what would you do, Philip? <laughs> Have a good laugh first. Um, good, it's always good to keep the humor. Yeah. Um, because we're invention based, I would guess I would say a much more greater focus on, uh, you know, what are, the, what are the problems worth solving as opposed to what can you solve? So I think we would say, if you really focus on what problems can you actually, what are they worth solving and how can you solve them through invention and technology would be our Excellent point. So focus and prioritize. Um, Ricky, the one thing that you would do. Uh, getting the, the right people in the right place and providing them the right incentives so that they can be properly immersed into, into these contexts that we want to develop. Talent and people, okay. Swapna? 
one word is uh, difficult you but can take a line like <laughs> <laughs> for me it's always difficult but yes uh, the the most important is being there like being there where you want to create the solution and just just listen okay that's what is the most important okay listen and immerse yourself in your end yeah. customer or yes and end. everything starts for so my uh, one word is a grand challenge i think we find a lot of people are inspired but don't know what to work on and i think people who understand the problems if we state grand challenges design a medical device that does x y and z and does it lower than this price point that sharpens people's focus so if i was in government if i had the government's resources i'd declare a series of grand challenges there are social problems that innovators should work on okay thank you uh-